Uh, thank you, Luigi. Uh, just over two years ago, on April 10th, 2010, I sat in a tent in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, 15 miles away from the North Pole. I was 15 years old, and my guide and mentor, Doug Staup, and I had been fighting through difficult conditions for the previous week. And the sea ice over which we had been walking was drifting away from the North Pole. Behind us was a disordered arrangement of pressure ice and rubble fields. In front of us, a nine mile long, 200 meter wide, completely uncrossable section of open water. And I was trying to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't gonna be able to make it to the North Pole. We had done absolutely everything we could. We were out of food, we were out of fuel. It wasn't good enough. And I, and I realized in that moment that I needed to remember why I was out there. What was I doing thousands of miles away from home in the middle of the Arctic Ocean? Why did I go through the months of fundraising and preparation and training? Why was I not at home studying for exams like everyone else? Well, when I was 14, I met an explorer called Robert Swan. He's the first person to walk to the North and South Poles. And I joined his Antarctic expedition in 2009. But at that age, I'd never been exposed to that kind of environment before. Uh, and I was struck by both its power and its fragility. But I realized when I came back that the reality of the changes happening there today were being masked by the striking environment of the Antarctic. And I wanted to know more. I became obsessed with the issue of climate change. I started writing articles and making plans, and up until the point where I realized that nobody cares about the opinion of a kid who's barely 15, uh, has no idea about the complexities of such an issue. So I tried to think of something different, something that could reconnect my generation to the issue of climate change through some sort of powerful, unifying energy. And that's how I came up with the idea of attempting to become the youngest person to walk to the North Pole. So when I committed myself to this project, I, I launched myself in it with full force, but it became clear to me that there was one major initial obstacle at the beginning, and that was the money. Where was I gonna find the level of funding that I needed to do this kind of expedition? And the answer was, I probably wasn't. I mean, I had no experience in fundraising. I had no idea what I was doing. So, I mean, this, this pursuit consumed my life. And I sent out hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of proposals, but day after day, the rejections just kept coming in. I mean, no one wanted to invest in the risk of a 15-year-old trying to get to the North Pole. And some of these were brutal as well. I remember sending a two-page uh, sponsorship proposal. The reply was four words. Sorry, but no. Regards. <laughs> so <laughs> was I just really bad at asking people for money, or, or was it just a terrible idea? I, I tried to keep my head down and, and move forward whenever I got discouraged. When I finally did get the funding, people started to, to, to finally believe in me and take me seriously. But the funding was just the first step, I realized. The next step was I actually had to go to the North Pole. So, you know, first of all, the physical training is one thing. I mean, I was probably the least athletically impressive person that ever went to the North Pole. I was the, the goalkeeper for the second lowest soccer team in my school. Uh, I could barely do 10 push-ups at the beginning of my training. And so when I tried to create this complex training routine, which involved um, partially pulling heavy tires to simulate the feeling of pulling a heavy sled, I, I mean, I had to build it milestone by milestone. And so for instance, it became about the first time I did, I dragged a tire for an hour, and then the first time I dragged one for two hours, and then for three hours, and then two tires, and then little by little, I got there. But the physical training, I always felt was less important than the mental aspect of this expedition, and I knew I needed help with this. I would talk regularly with a man called John. John is a physiotherapist, ultra marathoner, so he had experience with this kind of thing. And I will always remember what he told me to this day. He said, do not think of this as a countdown to the North Pole. It's too far, it's too big of a challenge. You need to focus on the next manageable goal. You need to take it one step at a time. If you don't, you're gonna go insane, you're never gonna get there. And as we were dropped off, Doug and I, on the Arctic ice in uh, 2010, 
I tried to remember this because I knew it would become important. Now, the first thing that you recognize when you walk out onto the Arctic ice for the first time is that in minus 40 degrees, everything freezes instantaneously. And this was a problem for me because my goggles froze up on the first day, which meant that I had no eye protection. So my eyes would actually freeze shut, um, as you can see on the image. Uh, they would freeze together, and it was when I was picking ice out of my own eyes that I realized that we were in an environment that held complete control over us. And if we were to stand any chance of success at all, we had to respect that. Now, despite this setback, for the first few days, we actually had really good conditions. And I felt like I was able to appreciate the Arctic for its beauty and its power, and soon we found ourselves talking about how many days early we were going to reach the North Pole. Now, in an environment as unpredictable and volatile as the Arctic Ocean, we were really in for a surprise. I mean, the next day we woke up, whiteout had filled in all around us, eliminating visibility. I turned on my GPS to find that we, our precious northward drift of the sea ice had completely grinded to a halt. I turned on my weather meter. Temperature had risen by 20 degrees. Wind shifted completely against us. We were now being pushed away from our goal. And on the eighth day, in the middle of fighting through it all, I stopped and I suddenly remembered thinking that something didn't feel right. The Arctic is usually silent. But in that moment, a really disturbing noise was growing louder and louder and louder all around us. This was the sound of the pressure building. It was the sound of ice breaking and crumbling around us, and we felt it too. We felt it right beneath our feet. The ice was splitting right where we were walking and we could see it. And it was the most frightening feeling to know that we were completely powerless in this humbling environment. We would have to battle through 12, 13 hours a day and then go to sleep, wake up the next morning to find that we were further away from the pool than when we started at the beginning of the previous day. So I began to lose heart and because you know this drift and, and all these conditions took, our, took their toll on us, I began to lose heart but then I thought about John's advice, and instead of thinking about the horizon, instead of looking at the horizon where everything was breaking apart, there was open water, there was white out, I looked down at my feet, and suddenly the obstacles didn't seem so big anymore. I focused on the next step and the one after that, but no further. And because of that, when I ran into a significant obstacle, it suddenly became a lot easier to deal with. But in whiteout conditions, there's only a certain amount you can do. And I tried to test my, the ice as I went along with my poles to make sure that I wasn't on ice that was too thin. But there was one misplaced step that sent me straight through the Arctic ice into the ocean and caused a moment of panic unlike any I've ever experienced. Okay, as I was submerged into this sub-zero water and, and I felt the water fill into my boots and into my, into my legs and then all over me, I began to feel panic setting in. But then I realized that the only thing that mattered was getting out of the water. Forget the North Pole, forget the whiteout, forget the fact that Doug was 100 yards away filming me. Um, <laughs> the only thing that mattered was getting out. And the difference between panic and composure came down to a split second of focus. And I managed to just about pull myself out using the ropes connecting my harness to my sled. But it began to get to the point where we had to change our plan as we went along every day. And I remember one of the most fearsome obstacles we faced was this big five mile long pressure ridge going east to west, cutting us off from the pole, uncrossable, behind which there was a, a labyrinth of, of rubble ice. And we knew we'd have to take a step back in order to move forward. So instead of trying to fight through that, we moved east. And yeah, we lost several miles that day. But at the end of the day, we found ourselves on this beautiful, thick, flat pan of ice. Not that. That was the pressure ridge. Um, this beautiful, thick, flat pan of ice that seemingly extended forever towards the north. 
So the next day, we tried to make a break for it. We had 25 miles left. That's three good days. We had two days maximum of supplies left. And I remember thinking, I'm not stopping till I reach the North Pole. No way. But 15 miles from the pole, we ran into an open water lead. Now, this is no ordinary site. Nine miles long, 200 meters across. Now, we were prepared for open water. We had dry suits, kayaks. But our equipment was designed to handle 20, maybe 30 meters of water maximum. So Doug plants his poles in the ice, unclips his harness, turns around, walks towards me. And I knew what he was going to say before he said it. We're not going to make it. This was bitterly disappointing. And it was awkward. And I felt like I had failed my sponsors. I felt like I had failed all the people who had supported me. I wanted to curl up into a ball in my sleeping bag, never talk to anyone again. I was angry and I was confused. I was even in denial. I mean, we were so close. How could we not make it? We were 15 miles away. So in my, in my journey home uh, and the evacuation, I became convinced, I became convinced that this was the proof that the Arctic was warming and that I had witnessed climate change. And then in my, in my announcement that I hadn't made it, I tried to tell people that it wasn't all bad, it wasn't a total failure because I hadn't made it for the reason that I went out there in the first place. I thought I knew what I was talking about. I was naive when I was young, and one misplaced comment brought on a backlash onto my endeavor, triggering a number of commentators to criticize me for, for my, even my character. One of, I remember one of the comments that I, that I really remember vividly was, this kid is a brain-dead corporate puppet who is a poster child for the profound ignorance of global warming alarmists. <laughs> I had made a critical mistake. By oversimplifying the issue, I had given ammunition to the skeptics and the deniers. But climate change is an issue that really cannot be simplified. It's an incredibly complex issue. It goes beyond a big open water lead, beyond even a trend in Arctic warming. It requires long-term thinking, long-term commitment, a global scientific consensus. But there's a lot of misinformation out there. We have people claiming that global warming is a sham just because Britain's 2009 winter had record cold spells or that volcanoes are the primary cause for the warming, ignoring all the complexities, or that we have people uh, claiming that the entire concept has been falsified, even though the basic science behind climate change was settled over 100 years ago. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there, and because of that, there was something beyond not reaching the pole that really bothered me. Yeah, sure, we had a lot of people following the expedition. We had created a great platform to engage people we were on our way to creating a sort of a movement. But here was one of the greatest scientific debates in the world today, and I hadn't actually contributed to better understanding it. And that really frustrated me. So I decided to go back. First of all, this had become a deeply personal endeavor for me, and I really wanted to make it. Second of all, I wanted to add value to the facts, not fuel a political debate. So I partnered with a bunch of scientific institutions. I turned it into a research expedition. We created, with the University of Alberta, a program to validate the results of the ice thickness measurements taken by the European Space Agency's Cryosat-2 satellite. But in our position right now on climate change, we're sort of in the same position that Doug and I were in when we were in front of that big open water lead uh, the year before. We've got a lot of people saying, we're stuck. We can't make it. We've got this big challenge in front of us. The end is nowhere near in sight. But let's take a step back, think about what we need to accomplish, then find a way around the obstacle and to progress. And sometimes this means realizing that the path of least resistance is not always the most direct one. Sometimes it means building each contribution to the science one by one, taking one strong step at a time. Sometimes it even means conceding a defeat in order to come back with vigor and take on the challenge again, not just one more time, but as many times as it takes to succeed. So when Doug and I were back out there on the ice in, when I was 16, the year, the year afterwards, we were better prepared, I was stronger, I had a clear vision of what I wanted to accomplish, but I didn't focus on the North Pole, I didn't focus on whether we'd run into open water again, I didn't focus on how much was on the line. I focused on making each individual step the most important step I'd ever taken. And they were, because each of those steps got me to the North Pole. On April 10th, 2011, exactly one year to the day 
after Doug and I were sent home 15 miles from our goal, we reached the geographic North Pole. But even in that moment, I knew that it wasn't all about the pole or, or even one moment of arrival. This process of tackling climate change is an ongoing one. Even our successes represent milestones, not the complete solution. There's always a next step. And in that same spirit, I returned the next year, just a few months ago actually, to successfully complete my third expedition to the geographic North Pole, doing a new type of research with the International Atomic Energy Agency. This is an issue that we cannot wait any longer to act on. The Rio Earth Summit took place two years before I was born. And it's now up to us to make sure that we take the next steps necessary to ensure a sustainable future. Thank you very much for listening. This has been a great privilege.